So hello, my name is Sarah. I'm currently a UX researcher at GitLab and I've been conducting usability testing in one form or another for about five years now. And two common assumptions that I've heard in that time is that one, usability testing is expensive. And two, that you need to be a researcher in order, in order to understand and speak to your users. And I'm here to tell you today that neither of those assumptions are true. I'm going to teach you how you can do your own usability testing and you can do it on a shoestring budget as well. So what is usability testing? So for those of you who don't know, it's where a user completes a series of tasks whilst being observed, and the observer takes note of what that person says and does. It's an effective way of understanding which parts of your interface work. So why should you conduct it? As your open source project grows in popularity, you're going to be faced with a lot of opinions and assumptions about what is right for users. And when you make changes to your interface, you might be met with some negativity or opposition. Usability testing provides you with evidence as to why or why not you should be making changes to your interface. And it also assures you that if you do need to make the changes, that they are the right changes for the majority of your users. Your time is precious. Don't spend it building features that nobody wants. If you can conduct usability testing early and frequently throughout the development process, you can understand whether users have a desire for your feature. Is it something they will use? Is it something they will like? And if it is, usability testing can tell you the point at which users can use your feature with ease. So you might have held back from releasing that feature. And you might be thinking, I'm going to work on it for another couple of weeks. But actually, if you can release that feature because users like it and users can use it, then it's great because the more users who start using that feature, the more feedback you're going to get. And I think we can all agree that the earlier that you spot problems in the development process, the easier they are to fix. And finally, users are not going to spend time figuring out how to use your interface. There's plenty more competitors out there. They just go elsewhere. So what are the advantages of conducting this type of research remotely? Well, I can speak to users all around the world, and that offers me greater diversity. And it's also more cost effective. It means I don't have to fly around the world to meet them. And users are also in their natural environment, so they're using the hardware and software that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes that can make users feel more at ease. So in order to find the right kind of users to speak to, you need to create a screener. And a screener is essentially a short questionnaire that you give to users to, for them to test their eligibility to take part in your study. So your, your study overview should contain um, details about the study. So when is it taking place? How long is it likely to take? Any technical requirements that you need users to abide by? And, you, and ideally, you need to offer users an incentive. Now, all the tools that I'm going to mention today in my presentation are completely free. They all have free versions, and I'm using those free versions. This is the only part of my presentation where I'm going to insist that you spend a tiny bit of money. It, and it doesn't have to be loads of money. I typically use Amazon gift cards, but even like a, a token gesture such as a sticker can encourage more people to take part in your study. You need to collect availability. I typically do this using a multiple choice question. So I'll offer up a series of time slots, and users can simply tick which time slot they're available for. And at GitLab, there's two uh, very important questions I ask in regard to permissions. The first is whether I can record the screen and the conversation that I have with a user. And the second is whether I can share that recording publicly. Now, I ask users whether I can record them, because when I normally conduct a usability testing session, I'm normally the only researcher, which means I'm also the main observer and the main note taker. And it's very easy to slip and sometimes become absorbed in your notes, and you might miss something. So being able to record the user, you can go back and you can review anything that you feel you might have missed. Secondly, my colleagues can also watch those videos as well, so they can witness firsthand the problems that users are facing. And I asked whether I can share the videos publicly, because at GitLab we work out in the open. And we have an open issue tracker. And this means that anybody can go onto this issue tracker at any time and see what GitLab is working on and understand why we're making changes to our product. So that includes all our contributors as well. You need to collect contact information. Typically, that's just an email address for me, just a way to reach out for the user. 
And finally, filtering questions. These are a way to screen out your users. So how do you write filtering questions? Well, first of all, you need to think about the kind of people that you want to speak to. So if you're testing something like installation or onboarding, you'd want to speak to new users. Whereas if you're testing an existing feature, you might want to speak to users who are currently using the feature or are potentially come to use the feature. So the other thing is, that, is that you don't want users to try and cheat your screener, especially if you're offering an incentive. So for example, if I put in my brief overview that I worked at GitLab, or I even just put my name on there and someone Googled me, they could work out that I work for GitLab. They might presume then that I want to speak to people who contribute to open source projects. So they might actually cheat the screener and just simply put, yeah, I've contributed to an open source project in the last month. And that introduces a risk. You know, I risk speaking to a user who isn't representative of my wider audience. But if I'm a bit smarter with how I word that question, and by offering up more kind of answer options, it becomes less obvious to the user what the qualifying answer is. And therefore, that reduces the risk of people cheating the screener and me speaking to the wrong kind of person. So once you wrote your screener, get it into Google Forms and share it via the appropriate means. At GitLab, to speed up the recruitment process, we actually created a research panel. And the research panel consists of 2,000 users who have opted in to receive research studies from GitLab. And what we typically do, we email the screener out to them, and we tend to get a good response rate very quickly. Um, so if you're thinking about kind of conducting regular usability testing, then I, I would recommend a research panel. You only need to test with five users. There's lots of research and evidence as to why you need to do this. It reveals 85% of usability problems. And you can find out a bit more via this link. And finally, you just need to confirm your user's participation. Reach out to them via email, confirm the details, remind them what exactly they're doing. Um, there's nothing wrong with scheduling all five users on the same day. But take it from me, it can be really exhausting, so make sure you leave yourself a comfort break between each user. You know, give yourself time to re refresh and prepare yourself for the next user. So whilst you're waiting for your screener to be completed, you can think about writing a script. And this is what a script consists of. So you need to begin your script with an introduction. And the introduction, the aim of that is to build rapport with users. So when users typically start doing some usability testing, they can be very nervous. So you need to make them feel at ease. So introduce yourself, tell them what they're doing today, and reassure them that you're testing a feature, not them. There's nothing wrong that they can say or do. And as they move through the task, you'd like them to try and think out loud, say what they're looking at, what they're doing, and what they're thinking. And assure them that at the end of the day, you're trying to improve the usability of a feature. So you really need to hear their honest feedback. Then move on to your warm-up questions. Never jump straight into your product questions. You want to get users used to talking to you. And the idea with these is, is to, um, when they move on to the task later in the study, you've already kind of built up a conversation with them. They'll feel a lot more at ease. So, th so they'll be more honest with their initial reactions. Also, finding out a little bit more about who they are as a person can sometimes give you a bit more context about their initial reactions as well and explain why they respond in a certain way. So tasks. Now, these are where we need to get the users to do something. So we need to give them an action to perform. So let's think about first the features or user goals that we want to test. So let's imagine, just for a second, that we work at Uber and we're testing the feature about to, with users about contacting the driver about a lost item. Now, if you've correctly screened your users, you might already know that they've taken a taxi with Uber within the last week. So you can pull that into your scenario. It's relatable and users will get it. They'll understand it. Notice how we've avoided using words found in Uber's interface. 
This is because I want to understand how users would naturally look for that information. I want to find out what kind of words they would think about and where they would go. Your next is researcher prompts. Now, I'm going to be honest, not every researcher writes these down, but I do. <laughs> and the reason that I do that is because when you're talking to users, it's very easy when you're making questions up on the spot to accidentally lead them. So I try and think in advance what I might like to ask them if they become quite quiet. And users typically become quiet if they become stuck on something. It's your natural reaction just to kind of go inwards and start clicking around but you want them to speak their thoughts out loud. Another reason why I do this is because if two users get stuck on the same task, I want to ensure consistency between the users. I want to be asking them the same sort of questions. And finally, the wrap-up questions. By this point in your testing, it's probably your users are going to have like a, a very strong opinion about what they've just seen. So speak to them, let them open up to you. Also give them the opportunity to ask you any questions because the likelihood is you've probably not been able to answer their questions during the study. I also like to leave a couple of minutes just to thank users for their time and to um, send them the, confirm their email address if I'm sending them an Amazon gift card. So the big day has arrived. Um, these are some tips that I've picked up along the way so I hope they can help you out. Make sure you minimise distractions. So you want to get rid of the 50 tabs that you have open, chuck your phone in another room, turn off your desktop notifications. You don't want any of that. Hide anything you don't want to share on your computer. So during the study, you might want to point out something to the user, something that they've not come across. So rather than having this awkward exchange of move your cursor over there, up a bit, no, you just scroll past. What you actually want to do is share your screen, so make sure you hide anything that you don't want users to see, so like maybe your desktop icons or your bookmarks. Do a test run. I typically use Zoom to run my usability testing sessions. I test my mic, my headphones, check that the session's being recorded. I prefer to write out my notes because it's quieter than typing, and I find that users are less off-put by this. And it also means that if I do have to share my screen at any point during the testing, then I don't have to hide my notes as well. And if you are speaking to all five users on the same day, they should be doing the majority of the talking, but it's still very thirsty work, so make sure you have a drink of water. When you speak with users, double-check permissions. So these are the ones I mentioned earlier about the permissions to record them and to share that recording. I only hit the record button at the point that the user agrees. It's very easy to become defensive when someone's criticising your work. Don't let your body language or facial expressions give that away. Don't let a user know whether you disapprove or approve of their comments. Try not to lead users. So if a user asks you a question and you're not sure how to respond, ask them another question. <laughs> That's probably the best piece of advice I've ever been given. Um, in that way, you, know, you, don't, you don't lead users. Um, a good question is, so, but what do you think about that? Stay mostly quiet. Um, your user should be doing the majority of the talking. Um, it's very easy when there's an awkward silence to want to fill that awkward silence. That's a human's natural reaction to do that. But that's also your user's natural reaction. So hold back and, and it'll prompt them to speak into that gap. Watch the time, make, make, make sure you're mindful of a user's time and keep smiling. Um, it makes users feel at ease. So at this point you're going to be glad that you asked users whether you could share and, and record the study. You're going to edit those videos. So I ensure that I blur out or dip the audio of anything that gives that user a way of who they are as a person. And the reason that I do this is that I'm about to publicly share those videos. And I don't want a user to feel like they're being judged when they are being publicly discussed. I upload the videos to a location where they can be watched, which is typically Google Drive. And then I create a meta issue within GitLab. And within that meta issue, I make a link to all the videos. And I also store all the key insights that I've witnessed during the study. So these are anything good or bad that the user has done. 
if they have experienced a problem and have thought of an idea of how that problem might be resolved, then I'll also stick that in there as well. I then ask my colleagues to go and do the same, and I give them a deadline to do this by. Once I've got everyone's comments back, so that deadline has passed, I consolidate everyone's comments. And I simply do this by only keeping um, the comments that two or more of my colleagues have heard. I then go through that list for a second time. And this time I'm looking for problems that two or more users have experienced. And if only one user has experienced that problem, then they'll be removed from the list. And this is because that user could be an edge case. And we want to design for the majority of our users in mind. You know, everyone's different. And this has three advantages. So the first is that my colleagues have a, and, and I have a shared understanding about what the problems are that users are facing. And we have an idea of how we're going to tackle them. We also have an issue that we can refer to at any point in time to understand why we made the changes that we did. And thirdly, and this is probably the best thing about being a researcher, you can see how far you've come. You can see the progress that you've made. So when you first started testing a feature, it might have been plagued with usability issues, but you've tested and reiterated and gone through that cycle time and time again. And in two, three months' time, you might have a feature that's working perfectly with users, and it's just a great feeling knowing that you've improved the user experience. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, these are the tools that I've used. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. So which countries do I test with users? Um, all around the world. <laughs> okay. If they can speak English, then they get tested with. Okay. Second question. Did you see any major differences between the cultures? Because in my testing, I don't see it so much. So do you see any, any hands-on figures you could say? Or? Do I, so this is a, a question about whether I see any differences between the different cultures that I test with. Not in terms of um, stumbling upon tasks. Sometimes what I find is language used within the interface um, is the main one. Um, and at GitLab, I suppose, if anyone who's a GitHub user here will know that there's subtle differences between the language using GitHub compared to GitLab as well. So sometimes I witness that. So for example, we call them merge requests in GitLab. Within GitHub, they're called pull requests. They assume that, no, we know the problem, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's about, uh, the question was about um, how I motivate my colleagues to be involved in kind of UX research. Um, so I, I'm going to be very honest with you. The last couple of jobs that I've had, I've been the only UX researcher, and I've typically been the first UX researcher at that company. So it's been very hard slog sometimes to encourage people to get involved. And I think the best thing is, as, as I've said, is like with the analysis, is make sure that your team get involved. One of my team members is actually sat here in the audience, and he, and he will tell you that he will watch those videos, and he will witness firsthand, and it gives him a better insight into you know, designing and, and, and coming up with solutions for those problems. So definitely tr try and bring them along. The reason why I let my colleagues watch videos at, in their own time and give them kind of a week to do that is GitLab is fully remote. So for time differences and things like that, they can't, my colleagues can't always like, be a part of that study because it, it might be in the middle of the night for them. So therefore, being given the opportunity to watch them afterwards, they, they still have a, you know, a, ch a chance to be involved.
test last before the user starts getting answers that are very short because it's already bored? Let's say bored. Okay. Or so yeah, uh, so, so the question is, is how long should a usability testing session last before the user starts getting bored? I think you need to experiment with this. Like most people say between 30 to 60 minutes. I actually find it's about 45 minutes. I test with typically very technical people, so developers, system administrators. And I'll be honest, they kind of get bored, <laughs> like, like you say. You can tell that they're getting weary towards the end of the session. So it's typically around 40, 45 minutes, my usability testing sessions. And how many features do you test or user case? Um, so how many features I test in a 45 minute session? Typically, um, the lowest number of features I would test would be about three or four, the highest about five or six. of users, so after you usability studies, if you have power users and regular users, how you decide which gets their priority to be implemented at the end? So, because you have a single user interface, maybe, and then how you decide not to remove uh, power features or how not to make it too complicated for a regular user? Okay. Okay, so this is, um, how do you implement changes from different types of user groups? Okay, so I think it goes back to the thing of you need to know who's, who's using the feature, who, who's your typical audience. And first and foremost at GitLab, that does tend to be developers. However, we are moving to this. Um, our motto is everyone can contribute. So we want to make it easy for uh, non-technical people as well. So we'll typically test with um, technical people first. We'll implement that into the tool. And then we might try with some like non-technical people. And we'll typically find that the, the thing that they kind of need the most is more guidance. So for us, and like a project that we're working on at the moment is like onboarding. So we don't have many visual prompts. And the great thing about like kind of doing that, that um, user journey is the fact that more technical users could turn off those prompts. So it's not plaguing the interface for them. But at the same time, we're still helping non-technical users on their journey. So you have shortcuts and results, kind of results to help to go through some complications? Yeah, it's something that we're actually currently working on at the moment. Okay. So watch this space. <laughs> sure. So um, do you have a, a mobile interface? Do you test a mobile interface? Do you have tools for that? Um, we don't typically test on mobile at the moment. Okay. Um, we're, we're concentrating mainly on desktop. However, we, we kind of do check our changes to make sure that they're OK on a mobile. But first and foremost, we're designing for desktop. Um, you basically only test existing features, or do you also prototype or do things like BD testing? And how do you prototype things that you do that? So this is whether we test uh, existing features or whether we kind of prototype new features. We do prototype new features. Uh, we typically use InVision to prototype. Um, and then it's normally based on um, the requirements of what a user needs. So for example, if we find out during testing that a user needs a feature that we haven't got, then we will move, move to a prototype first and make sure it works before we even attempt to build it within the greater interface within GitLab. We have questions. Oh, time for one question. <laughs> I can imagine that with uh, remote testing, you, you're relying on, uh, on video conferencing. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I, I typically find that some of the frequently issues with this, with the microphone and with the video. I mean, you test them, but the other side might have a problem. How do you deal with that? And can you comment on that? So this is how, how I deal with the, the problems that the user faces. Um, well, we, within Zoom, it has a great feature called like a meeting room feature. So users can actually come on prior to the call with me and check that everything is working OK. So that sometimes helps. And, and sometimes you do have to just kind of leave yourself a couple of minutes at the beginning of the call just to make sure users are OK. Um, like I say, stress technical requirements. If they need a particular browser or they need to be on a particular OS, make sure you're stressing that right from the screener through to scheduling the interview with them. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>